Okay, as as, as I was nicely introduced there, um, uh, I um, run the transgenic unit here in Rome. Um, it's a shame we're not hosting you all down here, it would have been great fun. But it rained today, which is bizarre. Um, uh, so I will sort of give you a more of a sort of a hands-on feel of, of actually using the, these tools to make mice. Um, and this, this is what I do on a daily basis. Um, and I was just going to give you a brief overview of the workflow that we do, and uh, then just go on and have a look at some examples and collaborative projects that we have used, um, and especially sort of highlighting a few humanized models. Um, okay. But first of all, I, I thought I would give a very brief background of, um, my background is in mucosal immunology um, and the microbiota and macrobiota that live in the, on, in and on the epithelium of the gut, um, which is, is very topical these days. Um, but I transitioned from this role, I mean, obviously we use a lot of transgenic mice in that, in that, in, in that part of my career, but um, I transitioned to making transgenic and running core facilities uh, about 2009, and this is around about the perfect timing, it was really just the start of the International Knockout Consortium. And, uh, and then obviously Talons were just coming into the lab and then CRISPR. So I, I absolutely nailed the timing to make that transition. And it's been a great journey um, doing, uh, following the developments in this field. So CRISPR, you can't avoid it. It's in popular culture, it's everywhere. Um, certainly in, um, in the West, in Europe here, in America, it's very topical. Um, and that's because CRISPR just works. It works incredibly well. Um, it's the only technique I've ever used in the lab that worked first time without any optimization. It just is reliable and it works. Uh, and uh, I just put this um, quickly on, on up here just to highlight really the kinds of uh, mutations we do uh, to make transgenic mice for the researchers here and um, and in, in Europe generally, um, and we make obviously gene knockouts. Uh, we, we remove whole sections of the genome if that's required. We've had some interesting projects where we've tried to remove long non-coding RNAs, which is interesting from the point of view of the direction of perhaps that's where the IMPC is going and investigating that element of the dark genome. Um, and then obviously uh, the clinical side is often associated with point mutations uh, or catalytic mutants to investigate the function of proteins rather than just maybe the, the on-off um, nature um, of having that gene or not having that gene. Um, and then obviously the, the other big thing that we do a lot of is to tag genes with small tags like HA tags or MIC tags or um, fluorescent tags. Um, and actually not on this graphic is um, uh, the, uh, the, the production of conditional knockouts as well, which actually are slightly more pro problematical. Anyway, uh, a transgenic core facility has to have a, a, a series of core services in order for it to work. And essentially, I just quickly remind people that cryopreservation is essential. IVF is now also a, a key technique. Uh, we use it to generate the embryos. Uh, we use it to expand lines. Uh, we'll even cross lines uh, that arrive as sperm and they want to directly cross them to save a generation. Then obviously you need to have people in your group that can do surgery. Um, people that can uh, uh, implant embryos to make pups uh, and do vasectomies. If you can't generate pups, you can't make mice. It's as simple as that. It's the key step in the process and the rest of it's just hand waving. Okay, and on top of that, uh, layered on those services is the transgenic services. And we do things like moral aggregations. We have a ESL uh, pipeline uh, using CRISPR where we um, um, do blind um, modifications um, with no selection and do scarless integration. So that's only possible because CRISPR increases the efficiency so much that you don't need to do a selective, uh, have a selective pressure in there to, to uh, find your ESL. Um, then obviously ESL microinjections into embryos. Nowadays that's routinely done into four cell or eight cell embryos. This just uh, increases the chances of uh, uh, your ESLs contributing to the, the germline and you have a high percentage chimeric mouse. And then the, the more traditional but very applicable nowadays pronuclear microinjection, which we use for, for nearly all of our projects because we're injecting um, uh, CRISPR reagents. So making mice. Very quickly, I'll run through our workflow just so you have a, a real feel of, uh, of what generating a transgenic mouse involves. 
um, uh, from the point of view of uh, utilizing a core facility. Um, essentially, you come to us with an idea. Uh, I always think it should be a good idea. If you're going to make a mouse, you're going to invest a lot of time, money, and uh, you have a, an ethical obligation to uh, make sure that the mice that you use and kill in this process are useful. So you need money as well. I already mentioned that. Um, and then you will sit down and have a project consultation, uh, discuss uh, how to make the mouse, uh, whether there's alternatives. Uh, we have a lot of experience. We can make suggestions at this point. And then uh, an ethical review um, should also take place, uh, certainly within the UK and in Europe, uh, we fill in a, a pro forma uh, that's part of a project license to ensure that uh, it, it has a, a place to go to um, once we've made the mice. Um, then we'll quickly design the guides, uh, do a strategy um, and uh, organize a the, the delivery of reagents and, and nowadays that is it, it's as simple as that as you don't need to do any cloning uh, the molecular biology part is, is, is kind of disappearing uh, we just order in the guide rnas the the protein cas9 the uh, homology directing repair template uh, whether that's single strand or double strand and that whole process takes five weeks so this is just giving you an indication then obviously we combine that with the cas9 protein um, and the uh, uh, the uh, reagents that we've already um, got. And I'm just going to minimize these guys so I can see them on the screen. Um, and then uh, and then we go ahead and um, uh, do the micro injection sessions. We might do two or three of these uh, in any particular one week. Um, and this single sentence sort of uh, highlights a whole series of uh, fairly involved. Um, techniques. So you need to have a uh, pseudo pregnant females um, ready to receive the female uh, the embryos um, that has to work and, and be reliable. You need someone that's good at micro injection or uh, nowadays we sometimes electroporate, but those skills need to be in house. And then obviously the skills to implant these embryos into the um, uh, reduct um, to uh, generate pumps. And if everything goes well by 20 weeks, you'll have some F zeros, um, which we'll then confirm by uh, sequencing across the uh, allele. Now I put this in really just to point, uh, point out that if you have a very simple question that you need to ask, answer here, then sometimes an F zero, which is kind of a, uh, a dirty or crude uh, transgenic mouse, because it can have two, three, four, even five alleles. However, that sometimes doesn't matter. And uh, if your model or your system only requires that, uh, that kind of level of information, then that can you can ask that question without making a transgenic mouse. And it's very quick if you can do that, if it's a relevant question. Um, again, your model has to fit the, um, that, that scenario. However, more often than not, we will then go on and make the transgenic mouse line. And typically that can take anywhere as little as five months, 30 weeks, uh, right through to a year and a half, sort of 80 weeks. And that's really dependent on how easy the project is, whether we have good target guide RNAs, is it a large construct we're knocking in? Do we need to go back to the start and redesign it and do the process again? So all of those things impact on the timeline. And uh, we're and not a, a huge unit, and we typically produce maybe uh, 25 to 30 new models a, a year. Okay, so I'm gonna run through some quick examples. This is a, very, a fairly straightforward one, and then I'll, I'll introduce some more complex ones. Um, and this is a fairly straightforward, it's a, it's a lethal gene, it's um, a gene that's difficult to study because of that, uh, as we discussed earlier, um, it's a catalytic, and, and we're not trying to knock this gene out, we're making a catalytic mutant, um, which in this case is in exon 2, um, and it's uh, two amino acids that just need to be swapped um, and, and changed, um, and then you remove the catalytic function of that gene, but retain the protein, and actually retain any other functions of that protein and the regulation of that protein that are independent of that catalytic function. So it's kind of the next level beyond just a straightforward knockout, what does the gene do? It's, it's kind of investigating the function of that protein. Um, and uh, quickly run through the design. It's a, it was a very straightforward project, this. Uh, we had two good CRISPR guide RNAs um, that sit, sat on the top and bottom strand uh, and the PAMs beautifully lined up um, um, and created two cut sites. So we design a repair template that integrates the, the mutations we want and silent mutations that um, remove the, the PAMs um, if necessary. 
Uh, we design it with two guides in mind, but we typically only ever inject one. If you can get away with just using one guide, it's much better. It has less complicating factors downstream. Um, and then also quite often we will recode, silently recode some of the amino acids between the two. In this case, uh, to first of all, introduce a, uh, an enzyme site that will help um, uh, downstream genotyping um, and also um, uh, actually allows you to design a, um, a, uh, a mutant specific primer, which again helps the geno genotyping uh, strategy. Um, yeah, okay, so we did a very quick experiment with this. We only received five pups back from the animal units. However, one of these had the, the mutation that we were looking for. Um, and when you do the PCR product across this region and do a digestion, you get a, a defined number of base pairs in, in, in the two cuts. Um, pieces. Obviously, there's still the wild type band there as well. Um, and so Animal 5 was a good candidate. And at that stage, it's just a, just a candidate. We would then want to sequence across that allele. Um, and if it's worked perfectly, what we're really looking for is uh, wild type read upstream and wild type read downstream. This is a, a sequence read, a, a mixed sequence read, because all we're doing is sending off the sequence, the PCR product across that allele. And typically you will have either uh, the wild type allele there and a mutant allele in the more simpler. Sometimes you have multiple alleles and therefore the reading of, the, of this plot is more difficult. But in this case, we just have two alleles. Um, the wild type and the mutant, and you get these mixed reads as you go over the area that we wanted to change, and you get nice uh, double peaks. And you can read off both um, sequences just by looking at it uh, and sitting down with a pencil if you really need to. Um, so that works beautifully. Um, and then, okay, so moving on to a targeted uh, humanization, and this is a, a project that was done um, and really just to try and uh, reproduce a, an exact point mutation that occurred in a single individual. Um, and um, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gene that has many different mutations that can go wrong. And it, it, it always results in a, uh, a learning deficiency. Um, it's quite a serious disorder as well. Um, and, uh, and as it's X-linked, it's primarily or exclusively found in young girls because it's lethal in young boys. Um, and so, we were approached by a, another group in Italy to, to, to try and reproduce this mutation in the mouse. Um, and, and it's in, in this exon here, exon 12. Um, and this is the sequence here. And it's a very straightforward single base pair um, change that introduced a, uh, a, 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 this amino acid into a stop mutation and a, just a simple G to T um, change. Um, so this was the, uh, the idea was to replicate that mutation in the mouse genome. Uh, these genes are pretty well conserved between mouse and man. Um, but the strategy really was to try and humanize quite a large chunk of that. Well, not, I mean, on the grand scheme of things, a very small area, but quite a few amino acids up and downstream of the point mutation to give the researchers the tool to perhaps use this mouse model as a almost as like a landing area of humanized area, uh, humanized sequence that they can design um, intervention strategies um, using, using CRISPR. Um, and this was indeed the case. Um, uh, I mean, just slightly complicated, we, we retained some of the mouse amino acids and didn't humanize them where they differed from, from human just to make sure we retain the function of this gene. Um, but fortunately, in the human sequence, there was a PAM uh, sequence um, and therefore a, a, an equivalent spacer sequence for um, CRISPR um, that allowed you to selectively target the human genome um, as opposed, um, which is independent of the mouse sequence. So if we managed to humanize this area, then we would have a perfect candidate uh, for therapy, which would be this um, human CRISPR RNA. Um, and just to highlight how conservative um, these two sequences are, um, essentially uh, this is, looking at the differences between mouse and human, and some areas are actually very conserved in the sense that even the uh, sequence of the, um, of the DNA is identical. Uh, but there, there's the, um, just to highlight again, the, uh, the human CRISPR RNA sequence in PAM. Okay, and we did get somewhere with this project. We didn't manage to do it completely uh, perfectly. Um, 
but we did humanize this part of the, um, of the sequence. Um, this area here and upstream here didn't humanize. And I think this didn't go, go in because there's a large chunk of a perfect homology here, which um, between mouse and human. And I think the repair template was just not used um, in that section. Okay, so just to really um, highlight that, we managed to humanize this area here, which allows you to use this human CRISPR RNA and PAM TGG here on the bottom strand. There is a mismatch because we didn't manage to completely do what we wanted to, but uh, subsequent experiments with um, cells from these mice shows that this human guide RNA does cut at this site. So it allows us to reproduce in the mouse um, the perfect uh, allele that um, the problematic allele that this individual had. Um, and then you can use that as a device to develop and, de um, and develop delivery strategies to, to try and correct that um, mutation. And then of course, this the SARS COVID-2. And um, obviously we were all in lockdown for a little while and um, I had time to think about what I could do to help um, and I was, I was really heartened to see that a lot of the tools that were created in the SARS-1 or SARS as it was and MERS pandemics, the tools that were, mouse tools that were created for those um, in, um, pandemics were used in, uh, in SARS-2. Um, however, they were made 20 years ago and, and obviously CRISPRs um, arrived and, and gives us better tools. So I thought, can we create a better uh, uh, test bed for future pandemics, so SARS-3. So <laughs> let's hope we don't ever have to use these mice, but I think it would be a good idea to see if we could make a better model. Because uh, a lot of the ACE2 or humanized, uh, humanized ACE2 models um, were either under artificial promoters, not in the correct uh, genomic content co context, or were cDNA inserted in the correct genomic context, but missing all the regulatory elements, intronic regulatory elements. Um, so there was room for improvement, and um, this is a project that's still ongoing, actually. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down. There was lots of great data coming out and um, being uh, shared across the globe about the, how the spike protein and the ACE2 interact. And you could just sit there at home in lockdown and, and work out which amino acids were with the, the critical amino acids that uh, allow these two proteins to interact uh, during infection. And essentially it boils down to, in ACE2 anyway, three remote genomic regions that all have slight differences between mouse and human. Um, and I highlighted in red, the, the uh, critical amino acids involved in this interaction. Um, however, only the ones in red bold are different in mouse and, and human. So we only really need to humanize, uh, certainly in exon 2, these four amino acids. However, there are other amino acids that differ between mouse and human. And as we're humanizing a, 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 a region, you might as well do them at the same time. So we had three successive strategies. Um, uh, this was for exon 2, a very similar one for exon 3, again, for uh, critical amino acids that are um, in this exon, all different in this case um, from human. Um, and then in exon nine, uh, there's quite a lot of critical interacting um, uh, amino acids between the ACE2 and the spike protein, but only two of them again, in this case, uh, differ uh, between mouse and human. There's a region here that also differs quite strongly between humans and it wasn't annotated as important, but as it sits between these two sites, you might as well humanize them as you're going. So that's an ongoing project. Ultimately, once we've managed to humanize those three different regions, and as those three different regions are all on the same gene, you have to do it sub subsequently, which takes time. Um, there's also a DPP4 mouse that essentially that process has already been done. Um, so that would be an ideal mouse to cross with. And DPP4 was the critical entry uh, receptor for MERS, um, which was very similar to SARS. And then there's also some data about CD147 and other receptors as well, all of which could be humanized in a very specific uh, way, which retains all of the intronic, extronic regulatory information for those genes um, in the mouse. So you make this perfect model. Um, which you then freeze down, put it away, and, and hope you never use. Um, and then uh, once you have all of these combined in a single strain, you could think about crossing onto different backgrounds. BALB-C would be probably the first 
uh, thing to think about because they're more susceptible to viral infections. Um, and then you could look at the collaborative cross, which you may not be aware of, but this is this great resource that's really useful for understanding the interactions between uh, infections and um, infectious agents and, and the host animal. Um, and it's uh, a blend, I suppose is the best way of putting it, of multiple different cross um, mouse lines that are all being uh, characterized into, I think, maybe 50 different lines that are then stabilized. Um, and within that cohort of different uh, mixed strains, you can find high, medium and low responders to beta COVID uh, and cross these mutations onto perhaps three of these um, collaborative cross strains to create this resource that you can then you get out the freezer when you need to, to use um, uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a very short period of time. Uh, but uh, this is going to take time to make this, but I think once we've made it and frozen it, uh, it will be use, uh, useful for future pandemics. And then I thought very quickly at the end, if I have time, uh, I just wanted to, uh, I was listening to this talk uh, earlier on about making knockouts and um, getting, and it's kind of very much a, the first read through of, of the genome where we're, we're having a look at all this dark genome and, and don't really understand what most of it does. Um, and I, I, I wanted to highlight this, project because it really brought it home to me. And this, this was very early on, actually, um, back in 2015, I think we did this. Um, and we got requested to knock out an NLS uh, within a gene, a fairly straightforward project. Um, to make the NLS mutation, we only had to change two amino, uh, two base pairs. Um, then we introduced a, uh, a digestion site for the ease of um, genotyping. And then there was one additional uh, shield mutation to um, create, uh, prevent the guides from uh, cutting again. So in total, five base pairs we changed in this mouse. And we managed to make the perfect mouse and we made the, uh, um, these mutations and mutated the NLS sequence within this protein. However, when we made the mouse and gave it to the researchers, they found that there was zero, it was, it was the same as the knockout. There was no protein produced. Um, and uh, essentially, the long story cut short was that uh, we found that on the opposite strand, um, overlapping with this NLS sequence in IL-1 alpha as it is, there is a long non-coding RNA, um, which is involved in, in, in interacting with enhancers that can regulate the expression of this, uh, of this uh, cytokine. And those five base pair changes that were all silent within the coding sequence were not silent in the uh, um, long non-coding RNA. And this had catastrophic effect on the expression of this gene. So it, I, I really put this in just, and we published it if you're interested in, in looking at it. And I, we, we thought of it as a very clear cut example of uh, unintentional on target effect of CRISPR. Um, Rather, people worry about off-target effects, um, unknown off-target. This was a very much an on-target, on-target but unknown effect in essentially the dark genome. Um, and and I, thought, I think it's a lovely example of how much further we have to go to really understand the genome. So we can knock out whole chunks of, of a gene to understand what that knockout uh, phenotype is, but we really have to be careful about interpreting that data because when we take out chunks of DNA, we will remove these non-coding elements um, which regulate other genes. And your phenotype that you observe may be more related to these non-coding elements that we disrupt rather than the coding elements. But you can't do everything in one go. So uh, this, uh, the IMPC is very much a, a brilliant uh, consortium that I refer to people uh, and, and point in that direction on almost on a daily basis. But it's the first read through and, and the first attempt to understand the genome we'll get more ref uh, uh, refined as we go on. And then just finally and very quickly, uh, we have Alessandra. She does wonders with ESLs. Michaela, who does uh, uh, an amazing amount of design and sequencing. Um, Antonella makes a lot of embryos through IVF and uh, cryopreservation. And then recently, Tian Wu joined us from Germany um, and he's uh, phenomenal at microinjection and surgery. And that's our group.